go. Good morning, Living Waters. Good morning. If you are new here, we want to give you a special welcome. Hopefully you got a coffee cup on your way in, maybe scan the QR code. If not, we would love to get your information, be able to catch up with you uh, later in the week. As far as announcements go this morning, we're going to whip through them kind of quick. But uh, VBS Volunteer Teacher Meeting is here today at 3 p.m. And then at 4 p.m. is the Members Quarterly Meeting. That's today, 3 and then 4 p.m. And then Men's Steak and Corn Feed. Adam Norker in here. Yeah, there's Adam way in the back. Uh, so Men's Steak and Corn Feed is coming up. Uh, you know, invite your friends, bring your friends. Uh, it's a lot of food. It'll be a lot of fun, great testimonies. That's men's steak and corn feed. And then if you've got questions, talk to Adam Nordiker in the back. He's in the red shirt. And then parents, you can scan the QR code on the screen now or uh, make your way to the Welcome Center uh, or nursery check-in table to scan the code uh, there and register your kids for VBS. And then uh, if you would like to volunteer your family uh, for Family Fun Night uh, needs, please see the Welcome Center for ways to sign up in that way as well. Um, okay, so uh, instead of howdy time, what do you think about like hugs, handshakes, and fist bumps? Let's do that. So hugs, handshakes, and fist bumps this morning. Uh, let's stand up, get to know each other a little bit, um, and then, then we'll get back to the video. Hopefully it's not too confusing to pick which one you're going to use, handshake, hug, or a fist bump. Uh, you can have your seat. We don't pass a plate around here for offering. If you would like to give, there's offering boxes out in the front, uh, or you can choose to give online. Uh, we've got a video that they're going to play. It's uh, the new pastor, Stephen Moore, talking about the church plant that's going on. I am the Engage Network church planting resident. The mission of the Engage Network is to see gospel-centered churches plant more gospel-centered churches. Practically speaking, what that means is when it's time to plant a church, the Engage Network finds a man, that man selects a location, and then together they assemble the core group, the team, the equipment that's necessary to plant the next church. When God gave my wife and I the desire and the opportunity to plan a church with the Engage Network, we knew that finding just the right location would be essential. So we prayed and we did a lot of research and we very carefully kept the results of that research to ourselves. That's why today is so exciting for me. Finally, at long last, I get the big secret off my chest. 
the location of the next Engage Network church plant is going to be in... All right, that's pretty awesome to know that our next church plant, church plant in the Gage Network is going to be in Huxley, so we're going to be looking forward to that and uh, blessing them in the future here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to start our, our praises this morning and singing, so let's go ahead and let's stand and we'll sing to him this morning.
Good morning. Yes, thank you, Brandon and team. This is good to be here this morning with you guys. Isn't it good to be in our building again for the second time? Praise the Lord. All right. Sounds good. You guys, you guys are, I mean, I'm surprised. 8.30 service, it was like the most energetic good morning I've ever gotten at an 8.30 service. So, praise the Lord for what he has been doing. I'm thankful to be here this morning. Thankful to be worshiping together with you guys and excited to open God's word. So if you guys want to open your Bibles, you can open them to Psalm 91. And as we get there, for those of you who don't know, my name is Pastor Chad, uh, one of the pastors here, uh, teaching pastor, and I have a wife and six kids. And just as we get going this morning, one thing I have discovered, that when we had our first five children, I didn't, there wasn't as much technology. I didn't have a smartwatch or an Apple watch or anything. But now we have our baby Hadassah, just some of the joys of having an infant while wearing a watch, um, just to give you a little insight into to my life and how things are going in the clean household. Apparently, if you have a watch and you have an infant, they can send text messages when you're not aware, all right? So Hadassah has become the youngest to clean to ever send out text messages. She started off fairly innocently by just sending, hello, to Natalie's whole family, like just randomly in the middle of the day, just hello, nothing else, sent that out, and then they're like, oh, we better, because I never start threads on that, so everybody was probably a little surprised, and like, why is Chad texting us, and why is he saying hello, yeah, we, you know, so we quickly explained that away, and I thought that might be the end of it, but no, my t sister texted me later, and then I sent her some information about something for a Saturday, next thing I know, I check my text messages, and there is the crying octopus, all right? So Hattie selected that sticker out of all of them and sent that to my sister, and she's like, what is going on? It's like, I don't know, I'm emotional today. I'm, I'm known as the emotional pastor. All right, that's a little sarcasm, all right, if you don't know. But, and just to, to cap it all off, Jared's not back there today, but if he was, part of our tech team, he was texting me about some pictures, and I replied to him, got him some stuff, and... Next thing I know, I check my text messages, 
And apparently, holding Hattie, she sent him the winking poop emoji. <laughs> All right? I have never sent that in my life, but Hattie selected that somehow. It's amazing. She's only five weeks old. She already has better humor than I do in sending out text messages. So, just part of the joy in the life of the DeClean household. But it's been a joy to have her, and thank you again for all of the support you guys have given as a church. It's been amazing. We've been very blessed. And so, that's just a little bit about me as we get started this morning. And as we get started, I am going to read Psalm 91, and then we will, then we will pray. And as I read this psalm, just think, right, if you think back over this last year, just think through your own life. Has there been any hard times? Times where you have had extreme difficulty and just wanted a safe place or a refuge to go. And think through your life and think through that as we read this psalm together. Because this psalm is an incredible psalm. All right? And it speaks, it is, it is spoken well throughout all generations. It's one of the most beloved psalms and it, for a very good reason as we read through it. So let's read it together, starting in verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, and nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the, Lord, just for the amazing promise of your presence, of your blessing, your protection, Lord, your promises that you give to those who seek you. And so, Lord, I thank you for who you are. And Lord, I just pray this morning that your word would be clear and that you would use your word in each one of our hearts and in our lives, Lord, to change us and to grow us, to be more like your son. Lord, that we would truly depend on you. And so, Lord, that is my prayer this morning. And Lord, we just pray that you would work in a great way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are in continuing our series in the, in the Psalms, the Songs of Summer, and we are in Psalm 91. Psalm 91, and this is a psalm that is given as a testimony, all right, a testimonial to who God is. Now, we have all seen testimonials, right? I mean, you cannot watch an ad, or I mean, sorry, a video on YouTube without getting some kind of ad, right? Some kind of ad that promises you everything you've ever wanted if you just watch this video. And then they keep talking for like 45 minutes without saying anything except for just saying, if you keep watching, it will change your life, right? Or if you take this pill, you will look like this shredded athlete who is just capable of doing whatever he wants. And all you have to do, no exercise, no diet, just take this pill full of red pepper flakes or something like that, and it'll, it'll, it'll change your life. Or all these things, right? If you just do this, if you buy this at 
piece of equipment and exercise 10 days a week, or 10 minutes a week, 10 days a week. Probably have to exercise 10 days a week to look like those people do, <laughs> right? But they say like 10 minutes a day, don't worry about it, just 10 minutes a day and you will look like this. No, no you won't, all right? Nobody looks like the people on those commercials by exercising 10 minutes a day. Maybe like they take 10 minutes off per day, all right? Who knows? But those kind of testimonials, we have all become very cynical of those, right? Like just random people endorsing this, this is great. Um, they make us laugh. I mean, I, li I love to make coffee. I like making coffee. And my sister bought me um, an AeroPress one time for I think Christmas or something. It's a coffee maker, and it's a weird looking coffee maker. But like on big, in the old box, in the big front of it, it said, this is the best coffee maker in the world. And then underneath it said, Robin from Denver, Colorado. It's like, oh, well, if Robin from Denver, Colorado says this is the best one in the world, by all means, it is the best coffee maker in the world. It is good. I admit, but I have no idea who Robin was, and that is not what sold me on it. It had other random quotes from people, like if, if I was a robot, I'd have the arrow press as an arm. It's weird people. That is not what sold me on it. But we, we've seen weird testimonials, right? Testimonials that we have become cynical of, that we don't necessarily believe, or we only believe part of. Which is good, because if you believed all those things, you'd not have very much money left, and you would still be very unhappy. All right? But this testimony is of the author of the psalm. It gives us a testimony about God. And this testimony is amazing for two reasons. All right? And for vi two reasons it's amazing. Because all these testimonies I listed before way overpromise, right? They way overpromise, underdeliver. The other thing that testimonials do that I forgot to say, especially with things like the Olympics coming up, they basically promise you that if you do these things, you will probably become a U.S. Olympian. Or if you do this, or if you buy these shoes, most likely you will be in the NBA or the NFL. And they don't say those things directly, but that is what the marketing, right? I thought that when I was a little kid. I was like, if I just do these things, most li I'm most likely going to be a professional athlete. That's what I thought when I was 10, all right? Maybe even when I was 17, but <laughs> dreams die hard sometimes, all right? But I was not. Even though I wanted to do all these things, even though I wore Air Jordans, I have never once done a 360, all right? I mean, a layup, not a dunk. So, testimonials often way overpromise and underdeliver. And testimonials, like, right, no matter how hard I practice, Right? Even if I bought the right cleats with the Olympics coming up, I could train as every day for as long as I could every day. I'm never going to win the 100-meter dash. All right? There's just, I'm slow. All right? I am very slow. I could never do it. I can't do those things because I'm not gifted to do it. The thing about this testimonial that sets it apart is one, can never overpromise on God. Right? God is always going to come through on the promises he makes. And so we know that to be a fact. And two, this promise of refuge, this promise of a safe place from hardship and from trouble is for everybody. It is for all who will come to God. It does not, God does not turn away. It is for all who would come to him. And so this is the amazing thing about this testimony and that we are going to see because when you read through the psalm, one of the first things that jumps out is that, that most of the verses are directed to the audience, right? Like, you will, he will, God will protect you from this. But verse 2 is very personal because it says, I, the author, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then he's, he calls God his refuge again in verse 9. And then verses 14 through 16, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the psalmist records God's promises to us. All right, and so those are the cool things about this testimonial as we look through it. And if you're like me, you're wondering, like, well, who, who wrote this psalm? And last week, we, read, we went through Psalm 90, and that was written by Moses. Psalm 91 doesn't have an author listed. And if you study through or read through, tradition would have that either, most likely the psalm was written by either Moses, because that was the last attributed author, and that's what tradition would tell you is that if there's not an author listed, then it's attributed to the last author that was listed. Or this was a psalm of David, because this psalm in its entirety, or most of its entirety, was found within the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so either way, 
cool thing about it being in the Bible and God's word is that we know God inspired it, right? So the ultimate author is the same, whether he used Moses to write this or whether he used David or somebody else that we don't know. The truth in it does not change. And so one reason why it may be Moses, as you see through here, there's some wilderness language which would bring to mind Moses leading the people through the wilderness. And also, the cool thing about this psalm is that it's kind of builds upon Psalm 90, verse 1, which says, The Lord, our Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. And then Psalm 91 just talks to us about how God is our refuge and our dwelling place. And so, as we look at this this morning, God is the only safe place, right? As we said, through this last year with coronavirus, with all that has taken place, with national shortages of this and that, coins, toilet paper, lumber, whatever, whatever you seem to need at the time is going through a shortage. We've had hard times. But the thing is that we, and people try and sell different things to help you feel better, to be safe, to be protected, to all these things. But the one thing that we can always turn to is God. And we're going to look at three things this morning about God being our refuge and our fortress. And the first is the presence of God. All right, we're going to look at the presence of God through verses 1 through 4. And even through the presence of God, right, we, there is something about presence of the right person that is comforting, right? We are comforted by the presence of those that we trust. And God promises his presence to those who follow him. And I, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about especially probably having another young child in, in our household, so obviously not old enough to do this yet, but when a little child is scared and you're standing around at church, what does that little child normally do when they don't know what to do? They come running and they come and grab their parent's leg, right? I don't know if you've experienced this, all of a sudden like you just get these little arms that grab around your leg. And for full disclosure, in first service, I've forgot the word pants, and so I said they grab your leg coverings, all right? So, <laughs> to much chagrin, because that did not get recorded, I was asked to repeat that. I don't know where leg coverings came from, because I've never once referred to pants as leg coverings, all right? <laughs> I do know what pants are, or shorts, or other things. So, they grab your leg coverings, which are normally pants or shorts, or a skirt, I guess, whatever. But they, right, they grab that because they feel safe there, right? And it's a great feeling as a parent when your child comes normally, when they come and grab your leg because you're like, oh, they feel safe. The other thing that often happens is when you wear pants that are similar to someone else's, you get somebody else's child coming and grabbing and hugging your leg. And that safety quickly turns into shock and terror when they look up and realize they are hugging somebody else's leg, all right? At least they're normally only a couple years old, right? I've not had any of my older children do that, thankfully. So, this presence, right, presence offers great comfort. And it is in the psalm, he says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, in whom I trust. God is a refuge and a fortress. He is a refuge, a refuge finding shade and shelter, All right? We, uh, last summer, we went out to to Utah to go through some national parks and just, man, finding refuge and shade in the middle of the hot day was so refreshing, right? Because it was like 110 degrees out there and finding shade and protection from the sun was fantastic. God is our refuge from circumstances in life. He is a refuge that we go to when circumstances are difficult. He is a fortress when we are under attack. All right, you get refuge is more of protection from elements or from things that are happening outside, whether it's weather or other things that are taking place, circumstance. And then he is a fortress, a mighty fortress. And he is, as we even sang about this morning, he is a fortress that we can go to. He is a strong tower. He is God Almighty. And in these first few verses, just to like highlight how amazing God is, he uses four different names to start off. The author does. He says, Shelter of the Most High, which is El Elyon. And the first time that we see this name of God in the Bible is in Genesis 14, 
when Abraham is offering or coming back having defeated or rescued Lot from uh, the people who had captured him and he offers a sacrifice to God and with the priest Melchizedek and it said that Melchizedek was priest of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. That is God, most high, possessor of heaven and earth, creator of all things. And so this is the God that we run to. And then almighty is the term, the Hebrew term El Shaddai. And this is how God chose to reveal himself to Abraham in Genesis 17 when he reiterated his promise, right? He had made a covenant with Abraham and then 13 years later, it says in Genesis 17, that he came back and said, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. I will fulfill the promise that I made. These are the things, as people read through this, this is what they would have been thinking of and realizing as they read through these things. This El Shaddai gives power and nourishment. All right, it is both together. He is a strong tower. He is powerful, but he also nourishes and provides all that we need. That is just in verse one, and then in verse, and then it um, continues. It says, my Lord, which is Yahweh, which is the name that God is most often referred to as in the Old Testament over 6,000 times. And this is his promised name to us. And then my God in whom I trust, Elohim, the strong one, the supreme deity. And the testimony is from this author saying that I know that God is a refuge and a strength. He is my fortress. He is the God in whom I trust. This is him living out, not just giving lip service to God, but right. But when we show trust in something is when we actually follow through, when we actually do it. And we talked a little bit about this um, a week, a couple weeks ago. I got the chance of going up to junior boys, all right, and doing some different activities, a lot of fun. They have a ton of energy. And one of the things we did was, was the zip line. And it's easy to talk about trusting the zip line and the harness until you're standing and then looking down like, I don't remember how tall it is, 60 feet or whatever it is. It seems like 100 feet, seems like two. It doesn't matter. It's way too tall for you to be and it takes a little bit to actually, right? God created us to not walk off of tall things, all right? That is in our nature, self-preservation. We don't easily just say, hey, here's a long plank with nothing below me. I'm just gonna run and jump off that. All right, maybe some people do that and they, they normally end up in bigger trouble, bigger issues, but we had to have trust, right? When, and when you actually live that out, when you actually jump off the zip line, you are saying you trust the zip line, you trust the harness, you also trust that people put it on you, right? Which, again, I don't even know the safety protocol, so I did exercise faith as I jumped off the zip line. And putting faith in it, this author is saying, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The author trusts God completely. He wants us to do the same, and this is the point of this psalm. He has experienced God's presence, all right? And it says, he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. Just giving the picture of a, right, of a bird, of a mother bird, probably with her young little, little birds, all right, whatever those are called, struggling with the words today. Um, baby birds, we'll just go with baby birds, all right? And she, right, covers them under her wing to keep them safe. And God does the same. It says he, he delivers us from the, fair, the, the snare of the fowler, from attacks, from people who are seeking to attack. Sin is not just innocent or bystanding. There is constant attack against those who seek to follow God. There's constant attack against even those who don't. But God is our protector, his presence. Just finding, just as baby birds find protection with their mother, we find protection in God. He covers us with his feathers, with his wings. And then the end of verse four is just, is so amazing. It says, his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. All right. And we all know what a shield is. All right. A shield you hold to protect you from t attacks that come on front, front on. All right. Many people know shields from Captain America. And if you have little boys in the house, you're super thankful that they gave little boys the idea of not only to use the shield like a shield, but then also to throw it at people, all right? Which is great, right? And they designed them as Frisbee so that they, not only do your kids pretend to protect you, then they throw it at you in case they hurt you enough. But, uh, 
And so it's a shield, but then buckler is not a word. I don't know if you guys, I'm doing so great with my words anyways. Buckler is not one I normally use. All right, and buckler is just, it's otherwise translated as bulwark or rampart, but the idea is of a wall or of protection that goes all the way around you, completely surrounding you, protecting you on every side. Or, you know, if you play video games, it's like that one power up that you get that like you're invincible for like 30 seconds. It protects you the whole time. The shield, nothing can hurt you. And it, God is our protection. A shield, not only in front, but all the way around. And the cool thing is, what is the shield? It's his faithfulness. His faithfulness is our shield, not my faithfulness. It's not my power that is my shield. It is his faithfulness that is my shield. Because if it rested on me, I'd be in trouble. I don't know about you guys, but I would be in trouble. His faithfulness is our shield. And that is an amazing promise. The one that we could just rest on and be encouraged and leave. Even if you think through, when we did our study through Hebrews, Hebrews 10.23 says, encourages us that the author says, hold fast to our hope without wavering, because he who promised is faithful. We can, wa- we can move forward without wavering. With, we can move forward with full confidence because God is faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24 says, He who calls us is faithful, he will surely do it. Philippians 1, 6, right? We know this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it because he is faithful. God's faithfulness is our shield. Isn't that amazing this morning? God's faithfulness is our shield. It's his presence, his faithfulness that protects us, not our own works. Because this psalm, well, it helps us. This psalm is obviously is all about God, about what he does. It is not about us. It is about our need for protection because we are weak. We are humans. We are in need of protection. So we see God's presence in the first four verses And then in the next verses, verses 5 through 13, we see him list out God's protection. All right, the protection of God. We saw the presence of God, and now we see in the protection of God. And in verse 5, he starts off by saying, you will not fear the terror of the night. All right, you will not fear, because God will protect you. And we all, if we are honest with ourselves, like some of us as guys, we like to pretend to be tougher than we are at times, but we all have fear. There are things that each of us fear if we are honest with ourselves, right? Whether it is fear of the pandemic, whether it was fear of coronavirus, whether it's fear of freedoms being taken away, or whether it's fear of how politics are going, or whether it's fear of running out of money or not having a job or different things, we all have fear of some sort. If we didn't have fear, the Bible would not spend so much time saying fear not. Or wouldn't spend so much time saying, do not fear, trust in me. Because we tend to fear. We have things that we are afraid of. And the, as you read through this, all right, sometimes people read through this and they're like, well, let maybe this list out. This is not an exhaustive list of things that God protects you from. All right, this isn't like, this is what God protects you from. This is not an insurance policy. All right, and I don't know if, I have not read an insurance policy because they look to be long and boring. Um, but sometimes there are certain things in insurance, like you think it's good, but then you're, you're not covered, all right, because it didn't say that specific way in the insurance policy. And so since it didn't happen that way, then you're not covered. That's not what God's saying, right? He says, it doesn't say in verse 5 that I will protect you from the arrow that flies by day. It doesn't mean that, man, sure hope you don't run into any arrows that come at night because I only promise to protect you during the day or at dusk or in the morning, just day, day only with the arrows, All right, it's not about the arrows. The idea is he will protect you from attack. All right, there are people out to attack. All right, and whether it's just evil forces, whether it's just enemies, physical enemies, or supernatural enemies, the terror at night. When the the Jews would first have read through this, right, these words in Hebrew, so doing some study, I'm a little rusty on my Hebrew. That was a long time ago that I took Hebrew. But even some of these words that were used in Hebrew and some of this, the pestilence of Deber, and there's another word, Keteb, that was used, they were indicative of even some of the Canaanite deities. 
And so when they read through this, not only were they thinking of the physical things that p would potentially happen, all right, because I don't know how many of you have faced arrow attacks recently. I am thankful to not have had faced one since we did do archery with junior boys, all right? And they were very good. They shot towards the target only, so we were all safe. But this is not just speaking against only these physical things. It's also speaking even of the Canaanite deities. He's saying, the author was ensuring them that God not only protects you from physical attack or things that happen that way, but also from spiritual attack, supernatural attack of things that we don't know. And so he is giving us a picture of his protection. You will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. There are so many things that if we focus on, we could fear. And we could fear greatly. There is so much uncertainty, right? We think things are so easy in our life, and until probably like last year, right? Whenever COVID-19 first hit or first became real in your, in your life, things like that, not only did that strike at the fear of some people with health and different things like that, it's, right, it started to unravel a lot of things that we took for granted. Things that we would say, hey, if somebody came up to ask me before COVID-19, they would say, well, where is your strength? Where is your refuge? What do you trust in? I would have said God, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and that is what we want. But sometimes when these things come into our life, we find out that what were we really trusting in? We were trusting in the fact that we had a good job. We were trusting in the fact that things were going well with our family. We were trusting in the fact that, oh, well, things are all great. I have everything I need. And God has a way of bringing things into our life to reveal what we're really trusting in. And so, right, we, we read through these things, and these things, though we would never choose to go through them, are actually a blessing from God in a, in a way. Because it makes us determine who we are really trusting in or what we are really trusting in. Right, because there are people who read through this passage, and they're like, this is awesome, I just need to keep quoting this psalm because it says, I won't fear the terror of the night or the arrow. I won't fear, right? It says, a thousand might fall at your left and 10,000 at your right and nothing will happen to you. And then in verse nine, it says, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high who is your refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. And some people have read this passage and been like, well, man, so if I'm doing all this stuff, then my life's gonna be good. Nothing will happen to me. No evil will befall me. That's what it says. That's not, God doesn't say that nothing evil will befall you. Or not, I mean, it says nothing evil will befall you, but he doesn't mean that you won't have trouble. Right? God never promises to keep us out of trouble. All right? He doesn't promise to keep us secure from trouble. He promises us to keep us secure in trouble. Right, that's his security. His security is not that you will never face hardship. The security of God does it. In that hardship, in that trouble, you have a refuge that will never move. You have a refuge that will stand firm. And that refuge is God. It is not your skill, it is not your job, it is not your abilities, it is not your talents. It is God and God alone. And that is what the psalmist means, because we can't read the rest of the Bible and think that God promises that nothing bad will ever happen to us. Because, right, even later on when we get to it, you'll see verse 15, he says, I will be with him in trouble, right? We don't need deliverance from a perfect day. We don't need deliverance from everything going great. We need deliverance for when we are in trouble. And it is God's grace sometimes to show us that we are in trouble. Because too often we think we're not in trouble when we really are. Because we are no longer trusting in him or no longer seeking him as our refuge. And so, you see in verse 9 again, it's, it's re-emphasizing because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. That is why no evil befalls you. It's not that you will never in trouble, but it's because in that trouble, you are making God your refuge. And in that, you can rest no matter what else is going on around you. And then verses 11 and 12 may sound familiar to you if you look at those. It says, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. 
On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. All right, and so just in case, it's kind of funny, you know, in case we were wondering whether or not people can misuse God's word, all right, to make it try and mean something that it doesn't mean, Satan quoted these very verses to Jesus in his temptation, right? I think it's the second temptation. He quoted these to Jesus. He took him up to the top of the pinnacle of the temple, said, throw yourself down, because isn't it written that he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and all your ways, and will they not bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone? And he was testing Jesus, trying to say, hey, throw yourself down. Let's see if you are who you really say you are. And it's interesting that he, he just quoted those two verses and didn't do verse 13. But Jesus replied to him very quickly. and He said, do not test the Lord your God. All right, so Satan tried to misuse this promise of protection in Jesus' life. And then verse 13 says, you will tread on the lion and the adder, or on the young lion and the serpent. You will trample them underfoot. And again, it is God's promise. And it's amazing, right, that we get to see this in light of all that has been revealed to us. All right, this again, this is not a verse that was lent, written to be taken literally, right? It wasn't like, hey, sweet, let's go find a snake pit and just start stomping on cobras, all right? Or let's go, like I said, right, you've heard of the, the sweet lion fences in South Africa, at the park, at the camp I, that I think Josh and a couple guys went to two, a year ago or two years ago, and I went to three years ago, right? Never once when I saw those flimsy electric fences that had no electricity because the lions were just like rubbing their face across those fences, <laughs> never once did I say, oh, I remember reading Psalm 9113. Let's just go run in there and have a race, all right? Never once did I say, I think that was what God meant. He wanted me to go try and step on their heads. All right, that would have been the last thing I ever did. It would have been a sad end, all right? We didn't see those things, and you know, like when I was younger, seeing like lions. To my shame, when we were at those fences, you know, I wasn't super brave. In fact, the actual thoughts that went through my mind were, maybe I should take a step behind Louie and my dad, because I know I can outrun both of them <laughs> if something happens, all right? I wish I would have thought, like, how could I try and kill a lion with my bare hands? But I knew that was futile. I have short hair. I'm not Samson. All right? And I'm not very big. You know, and again, these verses aren't meant to be taken literally. Like, that's what we should be doing. But when you stop to meditate on this verse, when you think back to Genesis 3.15, when God promised that the seed of the woman would destroy the serpent, right? Even though he'd bruise his heel, that he would crush the serpent. And when you think forward to Romans 16, 19, that under his feet, he will crush, uh, under our feet, he will, God will crush Satan. Not because of anything of us, but because of what God is doing. It's amazing to see this even in Psalm 91, 13, that we can make these connections through the beauty of God's word, that God will accomplish those things. And so, we see God's presence, we see his protection, and there is so much more that could be said about it, but then we also see his promise, his promise to those, God's promises, the promises of God to those who hold fast. And you see the many things that he promises to those who make him their refuge. It says, he says he will deliver them in verse 14, he will protect them, um, he will answer them, he will be with them in trouble, he will rescue him honor or vindicate him, satisfy him with long life, and show him his salvation. All of those things are promised to those who make God their refuge. Those who come to him and dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. And the fact that he delivers out of trouble, we talked about the fact that he is with us in trouble, right? When Jesus, when Jesus prayed in John 17, he says, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them in the world. He is with us in our trouble, which means we will suffer trouble. He rescues us. He vindicates. He will fulfill our life. That doesn't, right? It says that it will satisfy with long life. That doesn't necessarily mean everyone who calls on the name of Jesus has promised a very long life but it does mean that you will be satisfied in that life if you are seeking God. There will be full satisfaction whether God gives you 30 years or 80 years. 
following God will lead to full satisfaction in life. And there are three things as we kind of, with the promises of God, like we could, you know, again, when I first preached this, 16 whole verses, right? If you've ever been in one of my Bible classes, when we go through a book of the Bible, we struggle to get through like eight verses in an hour and a half sometimes, just because there's so much in them. And I feel the same way with this psalm, but we, even though we have our old building, I was assured I was not allowed to preach for an hour and a half. All right? So don't worry, we are getting close to wrapping up. Um, but I would encourage you to continue to read through this and just meditate on some of those promises. Just the presence of God. There is no greater promise than his presence. But as we think about it, like what does it mean to dwell in the shelter of the Most High or abide in the shadow? And I think it is laid out here in these three verses. And what God says, he, he says, because he knows my name, because he holds fast to me in love, and because he calls on me. All right, you cannot go to God as your refuge if you do not know him. All right, God is not, God is very interested in who and what is going on in our lives. And I was, when I read that of, I will protect him because he knows my name, I was reminded of Jeremiah 9, 24, 9, 23 and 24, where it says, don't let the rich boast in their riches, don't let the strong boast in their strength, but boast in this, that you know me. God is able to be known. Why is he able to be known? Because he's revealed himself to us through his creation and through his word, and most importantly, through his son. And so you cannot make God your refuge unless you know him. And then you cannot love him unless you know him. And we are, right, from the beginning, even in Deuteronomy, what is the command that was given to them? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Right, that was the greatest command. Jesus reiterated that when he w did his ministry. To make God your refuge is to love him, to put him first, is to know him, and then is to call upon him. It's a relationship, to call upon him in truth. All right, it's not just randomly calling out to God. It is knowing God and calling out to him. Psalm 145, 18 says that he will answer those who call upon him. It says the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. You need to know God. And you don't know God unless you spend time with him in his word, unless you spend time praying, unless you spend time with him. That is how you abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so as we close, I would like you to think through a couple of things. One, if you don't know God as your Savior, if you don't have, if you can't confidently give a testimony to God just like the psalmist did, then you need to start there. You need to know God as your personal Savior. That is why he sent his son to pay for our sins, to die on this earth, because we cannot do it on our own. He died, he sent his son to die for our sins so that God could be both just and justifier and forgive our sins. And if you have come to know God, which I pray many of you have and know many of you have, then I would like you to think through this psalm and ask God to show you what are you trusting in? All right, what are you trusting in? Because I realized, right, it was easy in the midst, in the craziness of the pandemic to go back to God. But a lot of life is starting to return to normal. And unfortunately, when it comes to going back to normal, there are a lot of idols that take up residence in our lives. Idols of job, idols of prosperity, of money, of family, of people, relationships. If idolatry wasn't an issue, we would not constantly be reminded to stay away from them. And so my plea is, look at your life and what or who or what are you holding fast to? Are you truly holding fast to God? Because there are many times when I have to be reminded that I think I am or I would say I am, but then God brings things into my life to show me that maybe I am not holding as fast as I need to. And I need to repent and turn to him because he is our refuge. And so as you go this week and if you want something to study or think through, think through the life of Peter right, who tried to do things in his own strength. He failed miserably when he was challenged by a servant girl and denied his Savior. Two, years later, 
being able to write confidently in 2 Peter 1, 3, God is giving us everything pertaining to life and godliness to all who know, through the knowledge of him who saves. And so this morning, trust in God. Make him your refuge. We are going to um, have 10 minutes or five or 10 minutes here to, to reflect. We're going to have communion in the back. And you can reflect on who God is. To take time to think through it if you know him. If you do not know God is your Savior, then communion is not for you. It is for those who know Jesus Christ as Savior. And if you don't know him, today is a great day to get to know him. And so just as we have this time to reflect, think through those things, the, the elements are in the back, and you, when you are ready, you can go back to get those elements, bring them back to your seat, and then Pastor Andy will lead us in communion here in a few minutes.